event for today. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. Thank you for attending ISF's publishing webinar series. Welcome. Uh, my name is Somaya Nikui, and I'm ISF's director and have been with the organization since its launch in 2009. It's 11 years now. Um, ISF's mission is to increase American Muslim presence in media, film, and in politics. And we fulfill our mission through four core programs. We provide academic scholarships, film grants, congressional summer internships, and year-long congressional fellowships. We have an alumni of about 400 trailblazers, and we provide them with support and mentorship, um, including this webinar series. Um, for this webinar, we have planned a discussion followed by a QA. and a um, So this session is being recorded. Um, so towards the end, when my colleague and program manager, um, Omar El Sayed, will cover over the Q&A section, um, you have the opportunity to type your questions into the Q&A box. Um, you can also, throughout the discussion, if you have any questions, type in your questions and then towards the end of the um, webinar we will make sure to address as many questions as we can and um, currently we are scheduled to end um, our event at 4 p.m um, so today we will be focusing on uh, publishing non-fiction last week um, we focused on fiction and um, next week we will focus on children's publishing and there is one more webinar as part of this four part series that will uh, focus on um, academic publishing and um, please follow us on social media and add yourself to our email list um, for any future webinars and also for information about these two upcoming ones and um, we will provide um, links um, to our social media platforms and also um, we created a few WhatsApp groups for, um, for people or Muslims who are interested in um, writing. So it's not just our alumni, but we opened it up to um, people outside of the ISF network. So there are various groups for various uh, focuses for writing. So we have, for example, an academic um, WhatsApp group. We have a um, fiction um, or fiction WhatsApp group. So based on what your writing interest is, you can add yourself to these um, WhatsApp groups. And the goal of these WhatsApp groups is to have a support system where you can ask questions or if you need a writing buddy or if you just need anything that others can help you with, you can um, um, use that um, group as a resource. Um, and now I would like to introduce you to our amazing speakers who, despite their very, very busy schedule, accepted to share their experience with us. So um, thank you very much for joining us today. Um, first, I would um, like to introduce Melody Moezi. She's an Iranian-American Muslim author, attorney, activist, and visiting associate professor of creative nonfiction at the University of North Carolina, Wilmington. Her latest book is The Rumi Prescription, How an Ancient Mystic Poet Changed My Modern Manic Life. Her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Guardian, and many other outlets. She lives in coastal North Carolina with her husband, Matthew, and their ungrateful cats, Kishmish and Nazanin. Um, please follow her on Twitter at Melody Moezi and on Instagram at um, Melody Mo uh, dot Moezi, and we will provide those links um, in the Q&A option so you can um, get that information. And next, I would also like to introduce Asma uh, Odin. Um, Asma is the author of When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom, and the forthcoming the pol uh, politics of vulnerability, how to, uh, how to heal Muslim Christian relations in a post Christian America. She is an inclusive America project fellow at the Aspen Institute, where she's leading a project on Muslim Christian polarization in the US. She was formerly legal counsel at the Beckett Fund for Religious Liberty and has held academic fellowships at Georgetown, UCLA, 
and Brigham Young University Law School. She's also an expert ad uh, advisor on religious freedom to the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe and a term member of the Council on Foreign Relations. So now, without further ado, I'm handing the mic to our amazing speakers, and we're going to start with uh, Melody. So thank you so much. And I think you muted, uh, Melody. Sorry about that. Yeah. Perfect. Oh, life on Zoom. Uh, that was so great. Thank you so much, Samaya. Especially the introducing me and pronouncing my name correctly is not something I'm used to. So that was really nice to hear. Um, I wanted to thank everyone at the Islamic Scholarship Fund for all of your amazing work and for having me. Uh, and Asma, I'm so excited to be sharing this uh, virtual stage with you. Uh, so as Somaya described a bit, um, my deal is basically I'm an Iranian American Muslim. Uh, also, I have bipolar disorder, I'm a feminist, I'm an author, an activist, uh, an attorney, and also a professor of creative writing at the moment. So I mention all of these identities because they're relevant to what I write and why I write. Uh, I write mostly memoir, uh, that I've written two memoirs and uh, another book that's a collection of profiles. So creative nonfiction is my genre. Uh, I write a lot of opinion as well. And more recently I've jumped into translating the poetry of Rumi, more commonly known as Molana, uh, for a lot of other people around the world. So I am here because when we don't tell our stories uh, as Muslims uh, and as all parts of our identities, which we can't put down and just start being Muslim, right? Uh, we, other people jump in and tell them for us. Uh, and the danger with that is that, <clears throat> that, I mean, that's exactly what's been happening. And I think we have parents who are telling us basically become a doctor, a lawyer, or engineer. Like we're very used to hearing that. And we have that on one side and we have on the other side publishing, who's telling us your stories are unrelatable. Uh, and that has, that has been my experience somewhat. Uh, I always wanted to be a lawyer. I was, uh, that was my choice actually. Uh, and then I, I went into writing, uh, I wrote my first book while I was in law school. And the, that book, I have that here, is called War on Error, Real Stories of American Muslims. Uh, and I knew nothing about writing when I started writing that. I hadn't published anything. I just knew uh, that I was reading books and watching television, reading the newspaper and seeing, uh, seeing us misrepresented and not just like misrepresented, but straight up dehumanized. And I was sick of it. And I don't have very many skills, uh, <laughs> things that I'm actually good at and writing happens to be one of them. So I thought this is what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna write about a lot of Muslims I know, uh, just to show, you know, I grew up in Ohio. I live in North Carolina now. There's a lot of people in this country who've never met or knowingly met a Muslim. Uh, and it was important for me to give those people an opportunity to meet Muslims. Uh, so that first book was very much written for those people other than us. Uh, and the initial experience of trying to get that published, and the reason I'm going into books is because I, I read your, uh, your responses to all those questions, and a lot of you are working on books or aspire to be writing books. Uh, for nonfiction to sell a book, we usually do that with a proposal, uh, and that it's a very specific way that you write uh, a proposal, and it's not the same as a book uh, itself, uh, though you'll have a sample chapter, for instance, uh, but I didn't know anything about that. And that's why this community is so great because uh, now all of you here, all 21 attendees who I can see in this little box, uh, now you know me and Asma, right? So you know people who've done this before and my hope and the reason that I'm here is to just help you along that path and, and give you a little sense of what that was like for me, which doesn't mean it's gonna be that way with, for you. Um, but I will say you should be prepared for, uh, especially, I mean, in the US, a, a world of publishing that is not friendly to us, whether it's uh, writing opinion pieces or, or books, right? They don't want to hear our stories from us, uh, which is, makes it even more important for us to tell them. Uh, and I, writing that first book in an effort to fight Islamophobia, 
uh, I learned pretty quickly that Islamophobia is alive and well in these public New York publishing houses. Uh, and my experience was, like I said, it's a book of profiles about young Muslim Americans. And my agent, who it took me a while to find an agent, and I found an agent eventually, uh, just by blind, not following any rules, sort of just blindly submitting <laughs> in ways that I don't think you're supposed to. Uh, but it worked out anyway, at least at the beginning. Uh, and she submitted, uh, she submitted that to all the big, a bunch of big publishers in New York. They call them the big five. There's five big publishers. And then there's self-publishing and academic publishing and all other kinds uh, as well, uh, small presses. And I ended up getting two of those presses who were interested in the book and they came back and they told my agent at the time, uh, we are, uh, we, we love the book, we like her writing, we actually, we think she's written about these 12 Muslim Americans. Can you ask her to interview a terrorist? Just add that as the 13th profile. Uh, and it wasn't one publisher that said this, it was two. Uh, and, and come back to us and, and we'll buy the book. Uh, so my agent comes to me genuinely excited, old white lady. They're all old white ladies. Pretty much all of publishing is not all old, but all white ladies, like almost exclusively white ladies. So many, except for the top, then you have some white guys. And now increasingly that's changing. Uh, but in my experience, I've worked with one person on my publishing team so far who was not a white lady. Um, so be prepared for that. I, I haven't been able to work with any other Muslims or anyone else who speaks Farsi, despite the fact that I write bicultural books. Uh, and consistently, um, the, the idea of when this woman came back to me and, and I was saying that they said to interview a terrorist, of course, I immediately was like, no, and she's very excited uh, being who she is and not, I, I was appalled, obviously. And I said, of course, I'm not gonna do that. And she's like, are you crazy? You could do really well with this. And by the way, she added, just for good measure, uh, it would be really great for your career if you could convert to Christianity and then be able to write about Islam from that perspective. And PS, like maybe just financially speaking, <laughs> she was right. Uh, you can look at some people who've been really successful financially doing that. Uh, I had just a little too much integrity to just do that at that point. Yeah, wow, Ghazi, I agree with you. Um, but anyway, I, I just ended up saying, okay, thankfully I'm a lawyer. I was like, we're going to do a mutual rescission of contract and I'm, you're not going to be my agent anymore. Uh, and I ended up pitching the book on my own, breaking a lot of rules and going with an academic press, which was the University of Arkansas Press. And I had a great experience at that press, apart from the fact that they didn't pay me. I think my, my advance was like maybe a thousand dollars. Other than that, uh, after after that, uh, the book did pretty well, and I was able to have have more of what they call a platform, which unfortunately publishers are very interested in. Um, if you're on Twitter or Instagram these days, great, keep keep your profile up because they care way too much about that stuff. Um, and in any case, what ended up happening for me uh, was I left her, found this academic press, and eventually. Uh, a few years later, when I came out with my second book, when I wrote my second book, in, in fact, what I mean is my second proposal, uh, that I pitched to different agents and because that first book was sold without an agent and then to that academic press and then I finding an agent. Uh, the way I did that was uh, one of the editors who had uh, really liked my book and couldn't sell it to the higher ups. Uh, uh, Random House, I, I became friendly with her, which I say this to say, make friends with the people who reject you. Uh, they'll be able to help you later on, especially if they're giving you positive feedback. And she was hugely helpful in, help, in my being able to find another agent. And eventually I did, and I have a wonderful agent uh, who is a woman of color and represents a lot of minoritized authors now. And because of her, we were able to sell that next book, uh, which was called Haldol and Hyacinth, A Bipolar Life, uh, which is a memoir about having bipolar disorder. And so that experience of being able to, having a bad agent makes me want to say to you, it's much better to have no agent uh, than to have a bad one, uh, especially if they hold you down. And I highly recommend if you do get in that position that you get a lawyer to, and even as a lawyer, I had a lawyer who specializes in those kinds of contracts uh, to look at your contract. Uh, in any case, 
that thankfully went well. But again, the, the publishing houses consistently have been telling me the same thing. And that is, and I imagine Asma, you've had, a, I, I don't know, we'll see what your experience has been. Uh, but I've heard the words unrelatable and inaccessible uh, more times than I care to remember. Uh, and that is something over and over uh, that I heard with all of my books that the, no one's gonna buy this. And it's weird because uh, some of the readers, the people who read uh, and the data around that show that a lot of women of color are the ones who are in charge of these book clubs and start book clubs and actually read books. Uh, but we aren't represented, unfortunately, uh, in publishing well enough at all. Uh, so it came to the point where with my latest book, I, I have the same agent. Again, I, she's wonderful, but um, I heard it again, inaccessible, unrelatable. Uh, and with the third one, which is about uh, the Rumi prescription, uh, I was told as well, uh, we don't, nobody knows who Rumi is. I got 10 like rejections straight out the bat after my agent sent it out to publishers and they all came back and were not interested. And then Trump got elected and there was this giant wave of white guilt that fled over publishing and a lot of other industries. And that's what led me to the place where um, I was, I, I sold at auction. So there were a lot of people interested all of a sudden. And unfortunately, that's how it happens is there's moments where they're interested in our books. Um, and even when they are, they don't put the publicity behind us that they do for other authors. All of this is to say, know what to expect um, and know that it, it's not it's not an easy road, but I I want you to know that ultimately, if you you're going to hear these words of ex, more accessible, you're going to be asked to be more accessible at one point um, and more relatable, right, in your writing. And the only way to be accessible and relatable in your writing is to be authentic. Uh, and just please remember that. Please remember that we are the experts in our own stories, and no one is more qualified to tell those stories than we are. And there are certain stories that only you can tell. Uh, it takes courage, it takes integrity and perseverance to tell those stories uh, and to get people to listen for sure. Uh, but those are your best stories. And those are the ones that transform us as writers and transform our readers and the world around us, inshallah, hopefully, right? Um, so tell those stories, those stories that only you can tell. And I promise you won't go wrong. So thank you so much. Um, Asma, I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Great, thank you, Melody. Uh, thank you also to ISP for having me and Melody here today um, and for all the work that ISP does to help young professionals in our community. Uh, and I'm just, as with Melody, I'm really excited to be sharing the stage with you. Um, I, I think you've been in, in the author, so you've been an author for a lot longer than I have. I'm just a year into this. And um, you know, I've admired your work from afar for a long time. Um, and it's crazy just kind of hearing your story. This is the first time I'm hearing it, but I do see a lot of similarities uh, between what you experienced, the type of feedback that you got, even starting from your first book um, and the types of things that I experienced just kind of entering into this um, just a couple years ago. So as I think it's probably apparent uh, from kind of seeing and hearing about Melody's books, there are lots of different types of books that get categorized as nonfiction. Right, so you can have memoirs. I mean, technically, even I think cookbooks get, I mean, in terms of the bestseller list, that gets uh, put into the nonfiction bucket. Um, and then there's books like mine, which are really just sort of about a social or political issue, um, or any 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 sort of academic topic, honestly, any sort of historical um, uh, topic as well that people want to write about. Um, for me specifically, I came to this from a couple of different places. Um, one, very much um, as, you know, in terms of my professional background as a lawyer who lives and works in the DC area. And from pretty much from the get go, of, from when I entered into the sort of uh, the nonprofit or public service sector um, in law, I had been working on issues that have time and again made national headlines. Lots of cases that were handled by my firm, which when I started there was quite small, uh, still because of many of them ended up at the US Supreme Court, ended up as really being topics and cases that captivated national attention. And so 
I went into this knowing that there, this is a topic that lots of people are interested in. Um, and I'll get soon to the topic that, well, what my book is about. Um, and the other sort of avenue into my book writing was the fact that I had spent years writing op-eds. Um, again, sort of based, you know, sort of springing from the fact that I have expertise in an area that is of national importance. Um, I think increasingly so, in fact, with uh, Trump in office and now the news or Supreme Court opening and the implications of that. Um, but for years, even though I hadn't written a book before, I had been writing op-eds for all kinds of outlets um, from the New York Times or the Washington Post uh, to Teen Vogue. I mean, it's a pretty widely diverse uh, and also running my own web magazine, which is called altsmuslima.com, where I was just very much in the habit of publishing uh, lots of different authors and editing their work. And so, um, you know, coming from these two places, I decided to write this book. And when I approached the book, I really very much thought of it almost as an extended op-ed. It was sort of like that thing that I've been doing for all these different years, now I'm going to do it, but just instead of 900 words, it's going to be, I mean, that book was actually really long. It was about 110,000 words. Um, and and so the, what the book is, it's called When Islam is Not a Religion, Inside America's Fight for Religious Freedom. And that's what my background is in. I, I uh, specialize in church uh, state relations, so basically religious freedom under the First Amendment and various federal statutes. Um, religious freedom, as I'm sure some of you know, is becoming, is, has become quite contentious, um, again, at the Supreme Court level with um, the, the sort of treatment by the court and the way that Americans perceive, for example, cases like the travel ban case uh, versus the case called Masterpiece Cake Shop, which involved a, uh, a Christian baker who declined to make a wedding cake for a gay couple, right? So you have all kinds of these really sort of hot button issues that have come up in the space of religious freedom. And there's really kind of coming to the fore is really kind of like this Muslim Christian uh, almost sort of competition that's happening. And people think that there's a, a lot of discrimination, disparate treatment um, between the way that courts treat Christians versus Muslims. And so I, you know, having been sort of at the center of this, having been, you know, having represented clients that were quite contentious, um, I just knew, realized that I had a perspective that I just, despite the fact that these are issues covered in every national publication, I just didn't see my perspective reflected in any of those pieces, except for the ones that I wrote, right? So, and it was like, well, what does it mean to be a Muslim representing conservative Christians, right? And what does it mean to actually know some of these people instead of what, how they're portrayed, right? But also at the same time, understand that there is hypocrisy, there are hypocrisies, um, and how do I talk about all these things from a place of integrity to call out what's wrong, but to also call out the existing sort of, you know, coverage of these issues and say, well, this is why I think that coverage is also wrong. And to center myself as a Muslim in that storytelling. And so I came to this again from just a, a pressing desire. Like I don't, this is like, there's this huge national conversation and I think it's hugely skewed. And I am the only person I, as I saw it to, to, to try to set that straight. Um, and so I, you know, so I set out to write this book. Um, I didn't come up with the idea until, so it was January of 2018 that I decided that I was going to write this book. And, uh, just to give you an idea, July of 2019, the book was already out, which I think is, uh, unusual, uh, unusually fast. Uh, by the time I secured an agent, it was, um, it was May, 2018. I wrote my book in five months. <laughs> Uh, so I didn't get the deal until that the end of summer. So it was August 2018 that I got my deal and I submitted my full manuscript the first week of February 2019. And it came out uh, a few months later. Um, and this kind of goes to the question of timeliness. I mean, it was, it was, you know, I went into this thing, you know, when you write op-eds, it's like, here's a topic. And before it goes stale, what they call, uh, you got to write and publish your piece, right? Because then public attention moves very quickly. And so I'm like, here's this topic, right? With, with the travel ban, with the, again, the Masterpiece Cake Shop case. There was a couple of other really hot button issues at the court, um, and, you know, with the big protests happening at the airport, ex at the airports, et cetera. I was like, this is like this moment. And I have to try to capture this, but I also have to write this entire book and get it out there pretty quickly. 
Um, and I think what ultimately helped me choose a publisher that I went with is just her dedication, uh, my, my editor's dedication to just moving as fast as I needed to move with this. Um, so just to kind of take a step back in terms of talking about the process, um, in nonfiction, when you write about these sorts of things, a really great way to get a head start is to write, an, for example, to do something that already shows a huge market for your idea. Um, so for example, if you write a piece, uh, you know, for the Atlantic or for the New Yorker and it goes viral, then that pretty much ensures that you're going to get a book deal if you want to expand that article into a full book. Um, I know somebody else um, who, you know, there was an, a Washington Post piece that was written about him and that piece went viral. So that was an indication, again, to the publisher um, that there's a market for this. Lots of people are interested. And so if you can do something, you know, I mean, in some ways, I mean, obviously a huge part of this is, is luck. But of course, the more you write about your ideas in short form, the greater the chance is that um, it can get a lot of attention and sort of help you get started on this path and it'll just make it a lot easier. Um, you know, for me, like I think I had that in the form of the wide interest in religious freedom issues. I, you know, I, I had, again had written quite a number of op-eds. Some of them were like in the top 10 in the Washington Post for a while, but you know, it wasn't quite something like what I'm talking about, like that phenomenon. So I didn't quite, I didn't have that benefit going into it. Um, I also didn't have, you know, what Melody was saying, I didn't have the type of community that ISP is creating here for you all. Um, I, I kind of just felt like I was sort of grasping in, in the dark, sort of like this vast unknown, trying to figure out, you know, I have this great idea, I'm going to write a book, but what do I do and how do I go about doing this? Um, so even though there wasn't a formed community, I did know a number of people who had published books um, of various types. And I just decided that you know, I'm going to do this. And I actually reached out to every one of them, got them on the phone, and just kind of got their feedback. I was, you know, and, and I think that's a huge part of this because when you set out to write a book, it's like, I mean, it's an entire book and you're starting with just a blank slate, just the white page, right? And you're like, I don't know how to do this. And the more guidance I can get, the more sort of like focus I can be in this journey to try to get as much advice as possible um, and to just be really focused on my goal. I mean, ultimately that's what's gonna serve you the best. Um, I would say, you know, the first stage before you get to a proposal is at least my process with every, anything I write is that I outline things to death. Um, you know, and for a book, I just really needed to know like how the different topics I want to talk about connected with each, with each other. And I think I also needed to know that there was enough for me to write about uh, for this to actually be a book. And on the flip side, there might you, you know, by outlining and researching and, and doing a lot of that work, you know, as you're thinking through the, your topic, um, you might also find out that there's maybe too much to say and, and you need to reframe uh, your topic so that it's narrower. Um, in terms of proposal, um, a lot of the same stuff that Melody was saying, uh, you know, it's really important that your proposal in the way that it's written uh, reflect the type of writing that's going to be in your book, right? Because that's the first taste for your publisher, that and the sample chapter that you attach to the proposal that kind of really shows them like this is your style of writing and whether or not they think it's something that'll sell or something that they're interested in. Um, and, you know, for me, writing about legal issues, I had to, of course, show that I could talk about them in a way that was easy for people to understand, that it was accessible. Um, I can't say that that was necessarily easy in the writing of the book. There's very complex legal ideas that I, I genuinely was sort of at various moments, sort of like, how the heck do I talk about, you know, separation of powers in like a way that, you know, the average Joe can understand. Um, you know, uh, another part of it was the fact that I was told by one agent, not an agent that I ultimately, uh, that ultimately represented me, but she did tell me that, look, the way that, that this is going to work, if, you, if you're writing for a general audience and not an academic audience, is that you have to incorporate a lot of storytelling. And you also have to connect your various chapters through one story arc. And when I sat down to think about Thing about that I realized that there was no story that I could find that connected all these different topics I wanted to talk about other than my own story and that was a moment that I kind of freaked out because I what didn't go into this thinking that I was going to write about something personal um, and ultimately you know I became comfortable with it but there was a moment where I was just like oh my god am I you know I'm gonna I'm gonna put the, myself out there put these you know very deeply personal stories out there and have all kinds of people including my professional colleagues reading all about this stuff. 
Um, in terms of agent, I shopped it around to a few people, but ultimately found one through a friend, somebody um, like she was already a client of this agent. Um, totally agree with Melody about the fact that white women do dominate the space. Uh, in my case, it's, a, it's an older white woman. Uh, white woman. Um, I thought it was helpful that by the time I showed her my proposal that it was in pretty final form and that sold her right away. Um, in, terms of, in terms of, sorry, um, submission and auction, um, you know, we submitted it to a number of different publishers. Now it's interesting what Melody was saying about politics um you know playing a role and so what she was talking about in terms of where is the terrorist story because politics absolutely played a role in my case as well and the form that it took is i take a very centrist position again i don't i'm not somebody who is like very clearly in the conservative bucket or very clearly or unequivocally in the liberal bucket i'm just very very centrist in my um in my work and that's really hard for people. I mean, a number of huge publishers told me that they loved my topic, that they thought, they thought it was really important. Um, but they're like, you know, you need to choose, like, it's gonna be really hard to market this, they basically said, unless you're in one or the other political bucket. Like, if you're conservatives, it's, it's really easy to sell it to other conservatives. And same thing for liberals, especially on this question of religious freedom. Um, and in retrospect, I think they're absolutely right. I mean, I know people who have gotten, you know, become like number one New York Times bestsellers, writing about some of the stuff, and they were very, very clearly speaking to a very select audience. And they're not trying to bridge sort of ideological divides, which is what I do. Um, but very much as what Melody chose, I mean, I think integrity and authenticity is so, so core to that. Um, because publishers are going to take you, try to take you down a route that they know is gonna sell. And you know, you have this sort of temptation that like these major, publishers offering you great deals, the possibility of a very successful, successfully selling, you know, book. Uh, but ultimately, that's not what, that wasn't the purpose of, of why I was writing this book. It goes back to what I was saying about why I wrote it. I saw, I had a story, I had a position. I think it's ultimately better for society, even if people don't want to, people don't want to understand it or read it. Um, and so, you know, I stayed true to, to my integrity. Um, and stuck with with my message. Um, and to my agent's credit, you know, she is somebody that I know is very, very like strongly passionate about her positions and that my positions sometimes come in conflict with, but she hasn't ever tried to push me in her direction. Uh, and she accepts that we have that difference. Um, so my book went to auction. I had a few different um, off uh, offers. I went with uh, Pegasus, who was formerly affiliated with uh, w. w. Norton and is now affiliated with Simon Schuster. Um, and I developed a personal relationship with my publisher um, to the point where I sort of pitched my second book without a formal proposal, even though I ended up writing one just for my own benefit, um, and have just finished writing my second book. Um, and in terms of publicity, I you know one of the reasons I decided to go back to the, my, the publisher of my first book for my second one, is because I had a really solid experience with her. Um, you know, I know people who published with Penguin, uh, Random House, or Harper Collins, and you know, their book just wasn't supported by their publishers. Um, I had in one case, it was the author's first book was a national bestseller, but he still did it, barely got attention for his second book. Uh, he said it was just like they had a publicist for him the first month the book came out. And then they just move on because I guess just, they just, just want to second this. This is a hundred percent true. My last two books were with Penguin Random House and everything she's saying is a hundred percent true. Sorry, go ahead. That yeah. was my experience as well. Well, it was kind of startling for me because, um, you know, like you, because in contrast to that experience, and again, this, it's not that his first book didn't sell. Like his first book was a national bestseller, right? He got on Fresh Air on NPR and, um, and yet for the second book, he said his, the publicist was only assigned to his book for the first month after its release and just moved on. Whereas my publisher was with me for, I mean, she's still with me. Um, and she got reviews placed in The Economist, The Washington Post. Uh, I had a piece in The New York Times, Teen Vogue, and et cetera. Like just all kinds of very diverse um, outlets and ended up just going on this crazy tour uh, across the United States. Uh, COVID is actually would have shut down the tour, which was about almost a year in, after publication. 
Um, and so because of just the felt that I, the, the feeling that I just felt like I had her support and I could just go to her with all kinds of ideas and she would try to execute on them, uh, which I think is really, was just, you know, just for me, just I'm, I'm realizing in conversation with other people when I have these conversations that it's fairly rare to have that. Um, in terms of publicity, I have a website, uh, but I'm not very active on Twitter because I don't think it's particularly conducive to my centrist leanings. Um, you know, I've tried, uh, but I can't really kind of do the type of language and rhetoric. I, so far, I haven't figured out how to do that, uh, that the type of Twitter rewards. Um, but, you know, in terms of my publicity, I did hire a radio publicist, so I ended up doing like dozens of radio interviews. Um, and I also had a social media publicist for a few weeks after uh, my book came out. And that's it. Thank you. Um, perfect. Okay, we are the experts of our own stories. That was so powerful. Um, thanks for sharing your story and experience with us. Um, it was very inspirational and informative. Um, we would like to now open the discussion to answer any questions that you may have. Um, there is a Q&A um, box at the bottom of your screen. If you could please um, post your message to that section. And my colleague Omar will um, lead the Q&A um, segment of this webinar. So um, Omar, handing it to you. Assalamualaikum, everyone. Very nice to meet everyone here. Uh, as Sumeya mentioned, my name is Omar. I'm the program manager for ISF. Uh, very excited to be with you all. I just want to give a, a long distance. Uh, can everyone hear me? Am I good? Okay, good. Sorry, I just had the uh, screen freeze on my side, but if you guys can hear me, that's so great. Anyways, I think we're in the middle of a long distance uh, round of applause for our amazing speakers uh, who are giving us their amazing time, uh, very valuable time, and just want to express uh, sincere gratitude to them for offering their, um, you know, their insight, their expertise. Uh, I definitely learned a lot, uh, and it's very interesting to see that they had a very similar uh, experience. So uh, I believe some people have already done it. Uh, uh, by posting questions in the chat. Uh, but as Sumeya mentioned, we're gonna try our best to keep track of questions through the Q&A option, uh, which you can see at the bottom of the Zoom uh, meeting. So if possible, uh, could we have, uh, if you've already posted something in the chat, just post you, only one time, just post it into the uh, Q&A section if that's possible. So uh, speakers, I think we're gonna get started with uh, questions. Are you ready? Okay, good. I think I just, I have a, okay, well, as long as I can hear you, I think we're good. Okay, so the first question is, uh, salam everyone, I've completed most of my proposal for a nonfiction autobiographical book. Uh, I am just going through it and editing it. What would you recommend to be my next step? Um, you want me to, you want to start off, Asma, or I, I'm happy to start off. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, sure. The at this point, editing it is really important uh, to get it to the point where it's ready, but also don't edit it to the point that you never submit it. Uh, at this point, what you want to be doing is looking for an agent. Uh, if you want to be selling it to uh, one of the big five, that's that's where you're going. If you're looking at an academic press, uh, that's a different story. You can sell books to academic presses without an agent, again, generally you're not, that's not a way to make a living <laughs> per se. Uh, and then you can also, independent presses even still, uh, you would probably need an agent depending on how big that is. So your next step is to get an agent. What do you think, Asma? Yeah, I mean, I agree that it depends on who you're, who you're trying to pitch it to. Um, you know, I think if it's your first time around, you should definitely get an agent. I think just having a second set of eyes on your proposal and just having someone to navigate through the process with you is, is more than enough reason to find one. Um, I think in terms of, you know, when you're editing it, what I did that I thought was really helpful um, was I actually based my, I modeled my proposal on 
a proposal that of a book that got sold and it was something that this other agent not one that I went with um, kind of uses as sort of like a model proposal like just a really really well written one and just seeing it just clarify things for me so much and when I modeled mine after that one um, it just made my proposal so much stronger so even though you have one I would say if you could find one in your specific genre like that you know um, agents and publishers just love and it has successfully sold then try to find that and try to model yours uh, based on that one. And I'm happy to share my proposals with anybody who's interested um, for my last two books. Uh, they did well for me. So I'm happy to share them. If anybody wants to email me, I'll put, can I put my email in the chat to do that? I'll do that. Sure. That's okay. very generous. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> and I'm happy as well. Go ahead and add that. Awesome. Yeah, I just want to take this time. I, uh, I put it all the way at the beginning of the chat, but uh, I can do it again right now. Uh, if everyone can just take a moment and visit our uh, Melody and Asmat's uh, uh, website. Hope everyone can see this. Uh, yeah, definitely give them a look. I went through it. Beautiful websites. Uh, be sure to support the speakers, please. Okay, so let's move on to the next uh, question. I think it's actually heading in the direction of what you were both speaking about uh, later on. Uh, but if someone wants to start in short, for, short form with a long-term goal of writing a book, do you suggest self-publishing your short form or finding blogs or websites that will accept your writing? Uh, any suggestions? I don't suggest self-publishing. I suggest finding an outlet that gives you some level of credibility. Um, unless you're starting your, a blog that's unique, um, to itself, but in my experience, I don't like, I don't publish on my website. I publish in different news outlets. Um, mm. and that's what I would recommend. Yeah, you? I recommend the same. I mean, I think that lesser known outlets are a good place for just sort of testing out, you know, your writing and, and like getting comments on it, you know, just kind of, if, if it's a really new process for you, um, I think it's a place to kind of just test the waters. Um, but if you are very you know, focused on translating that into a book and it's a, it's a fairly short term goal, then I think kind of jumping right into a very sort of public mainstream publication is the way to go. And again, you know, I was saying like, you never know, like that might be the idea that that goes viral, right? And that pretty much like paves, paves the way for you. And I, ju I just want to add, you never know what outlet, like I've submitted blindly to so many people. Um, and I remember one, I wrote an obituary for a friend of mine who died in Atlanta. Um, so I submitted it to the Atlanta Journal Constitution and they never even got back to me, but I also submitted it to NPR and NPR got back to me right away and said, we want you to read this on the air today and do an obituary for someone who was completely unknown um, for a national audience of at that point, like millions of people. So. Um, just because, you know, AJC was not going to reach that same audience that NPR did, but they not only didn't reject me, they didn't even <laughs> reply to me. And that's another thing to get used to. Uh, if you're doing opinion pieces, um, that there's a lot of people that won't reply to you. Um, and if you do get replies from people, again, maintaining those relationships with people, even if they reply to reject you, to thank them, because that's actually a courtesy in this industry for them to even reply and say, we pass. Right. And I, you know, what I would add, um, something you said reminded me, um, I actually thanked my editor at the New York Times, like in my acknowledgements, because she published an op-ed that basically encapsulated like the central point of my book, um, which is this phenomenon of, of people arguing, including in court, that Islam is not a religion in an attempt to uh, basically uh, strip religious freedom rights from Muslims. And I just remember when I was writing my book, the, the dozens upon dozens of comments that were on that article were like such a great way for me to write and to actually, because you know, as a lawyer, you know, they always teach you figure out what the counter argument is and address it in your writing. And so I'm like, it was a perfect, it was a perfect sort of platform for me. Like, oh, these are the things that this argument makes people think of. They're like, make the comparison to Catholics and how this was said about Catholicism. So I made sure I had a section on that, you know, like, well, you know, or you have like the anti-Muslim people showing up and being like, well, what about, you know, Islam being used as a political tool. So I knew that I had to address that. And so I think that's the other benefit of this. Like you just, it expands like your argument in ways that you might not have uh, thought to expand. 
Glad the uh, comment section is good for something. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I think there was a second part of this question, just to clarify. They're asking if there's any websites uh, either of you would suggest to begin uh, maybe sharing your writing with, or uh, I know maybe we don't have time and there's just it, too well, many. It depends entirely on the outlet, um, or rather the topic that you're writing about. You don't, you know, you're not gonna submit you know, something that's political for a, a nature magazine, you know, like you're not going to do that. But um, I, yeah, it absolutely depends. And there's so many Facebook groups uh, for like binders full of women essayists or there's, there's tons of Facebook groups that will, that people are sharing um, editors names and things like that. So you just need to do the research and, and it's, it, it isn't that hard to find. Uh, so, okay, so just to clarify, we're answering the questions in the Q&A box, which is located uh, at the bottom of your Zoom. So there should be like a red number next to it. That should kind of clue you to where we're at. Uh, if you want to ask any questions, uh, we're answering from here. Not sure if you can read them, but the next question is, should you have a uh, completed or near completed manuscript before submitting a proposal? No. No. I mean, if you're writing fiction, then I think that's definitely uh, preferred. Um, Melody, I don't, you know, I know that there's like a a blurry, like a line that's more blurry between memoir and fiction than there is between the type of stuff that I write. Um, but in my case, absolutely not. Like I just, um, I only had to write one sample chapter. Yeah, same here. I mean, the if it's your first book, you may, they want more sample chapters from you. If it's your fourth book, you may not need anything. So, I mean, there are all of these things that we're telling you is just advice based on our experience or like personally from my experience. And uh, there are no hard and fast rules in this. It's not like, um, yeah, it's, it's not like any other profession that we're pushed into. It's not like the law in that way. There, there's more hard and fast rules, even though there's many interpretations. Okay, uh, next question. How do you get started when you have so many ideas and you don't know how to begin writing? Have you considered a ghostwriter? Do you recommend that route? I do a lot of public speaking, but writing terrifies me as it's not how my brain works. Mm. I, I don't know, Hasami, I, I really think, yeah. I mean, I wanna read your story if that's what you're writing. <laughs> um, and I, I, there, for some people that works out really well. Um, and if, that, if writing is not what you do, this is not an easy thing. This isn't, I, you hear people say all the time, like when I retire, I wanna write a memoir, like good for you. Like when I retire, I wanna do brain surgery. You know, like not everyone is, is equipped to do this. <laughs> Um, both just in terms of having the ability to take as much rejection as it takes to be able to succeed in this profession. It takes an ability to be rejected over and over. And if you have the attitude of just, I'm going to show you, then like if when people reject me, it just makes me want to succeed even more. Right. So if you have that attitude, that's great. Um, I, it doesn't mean it doesn't still hurt when you're rejected, but, um, in terms of a ghostwriter, like for some people that that does work out. And you, if you feel writing isn't your forte, then um, it's it's totally not out of the question to consider. I like I have a friend who's a neuroscientist and he's brilliant and he wrote a memoir and he needs to have somebody else write rewrite it. Um, and he took a lot of time to do that away from his research and he's doing really important research. So you got to like weigh the weigh that for yourself. Yeah, I would agree. I mean, I have to say, like, I think, you know, I've always considered myself and been considered by others to be a writer. So in that sense, writing doesn't terrify me. But, to, I, you know, I had written chapters of other books, um, academic and non-academic. I had written, like I said, dozens of op-eds. But the, I, when it came to time to thinking about a book that I knew that I wanted to write, but just getting my brain to sort of, like, think about that, because a book is a very long project um, and it's something that requires a lot of time and dedication. Like I, I also, like my, my brain just wouldn't, couldn't figure it out, to be honest. Um, and I had a conversation with someone who was an editor of a magazine and she 
she actually helped me distill all of these crazy thoughts that were you know, floating through my mind and just be like, this is how you should frame it, right? Take, because I was just kind of blabbering one day. She's like, just start talking. And, and I was like, yeah, you know what? In this one case, we represented um, this, this mosque when the argument was that Islam is not a religion. She goes, there you go. That's your frame. Just center the entire book around this idea of Islam is not a religion. Uh, or the claim that Islam is not a religion. And that just like brought so much clarity, even though of course I still did the outlining. Like you gotta sit there and do the outlining. That's another way to get your brain to focus. Um, it's just like, you know, cause a white page is very scary. Just be like, here are my ideas, let's put, start putting this in order. Um, but just, you know, wanted to share the fact that my, my brain also kind of freaked out, even though I do a lot of writing. Amazing thoughts, thank you. Uh, the next question in the last session, one panel suggested to use Ingram's self-published network instead. I'm actively looking to increase the sale of my book, but all that you both are telling, uh, all that both of you are telling or speaking about to reach out to publishers is so daunting. At what sales threshold uh, should I maybe not even worry about using an established channel as far as increasing the sales? I don't understand the question, honestly. Um, I don't know about sales thresholds, but Asma, do you understand the question? I think they're saying, if I can try, uh, they're trying to ask, uh, you know, I'm trying to market the book on my own. Uh, I, I'm not trying to go through publishers, right? It seem, that seems uh, tough for them. And I don't think that you have a similar experience. So I, yeah. yeah, I think that's kind of the basis of the question. Yeah, and I, I think by threshold, my understanding is that sort of like if I can sell 1500 on my own, how much more can an established publisher get me, right? If I'm trying to, you know, will it get me to 5,000? Um, you know, and so I can't really answer that to be honest because I didn't even consider self publishing and I've never self published. Um, but for me, it was also just not sort of conducive to my purpose at the end of the day. Like I was like, for me, it wasn't about the number of books sold, it was about how widely my idea was disseminated and you might think that those are it's one of the one of the same thing but you know I just don't think I would have landed a review with the economist if I had self-published that sort of thing right and like um and so for me it just was sort of like a an obvious thing that I had to kind of go the established routes uh, with people who had the connections and and I also have no experience with self-publishing, but I do know that like there are these great stories of people who self-publish and do really well. There's no one right route to do this. Um, and it depends, again, it depends what you're writing about. Um, there's, Asma, do you know that there's a book there? It's, it's fiction about a woman who has Alzheimer's who teaches at Harvard, but it's, it's fictitious. They made a movie out of it. I forget the name of the book. I think Alice is in the title. In any case, um, that book is about somebody who has Alzheimer's. Uh, so that, that person, whoever wrote that book, who I can't remember, uh, went to the Alzheimer's Association and published it with the Alzheimer's Association. And then I, some PRA, Penguin Random House, or uh, Simon Schuster, or one of the big five came, bought it. It eventually became a major motion picture uh, that I obviously can't remember the name of. <laughs> Maybe I should look into something <laughs> with Alzheimer's. I don't know. It's, do you know that book? What is it? Alice, something Alice. Anyway, um, point being, there's just so many ways of doing it. Yeah, Asma? Yeah, I mean, so you, you bring up an important point because I see in the comment, in the, the Q&A that he, um, the questioner has written a book about Prophet Muhammad, right? A Young Adult's Guide to the Early okay. History of Islam. So I think depending on your topic, I don't think there's much point, you know, if it's a very sort of like uh, targeted audience, um, or what they call sort of like inside baseball type thing, where it's just like a particular community is the one that's going to be the one reading it and not many people outside the community are going to be interested. But I don't think it makes as much sense for you to be spending a ton of time trying to go to like Simon Schuster uh, or, or even smaller presses like Beacon, right? Like that's the type of book that I can tell you, you'd probably be better off either going to an Islamic publisher or self-publishing, right? So like for instance, like Hamza Yusuf has written a book um, I think it's on like the purification of the soul. And he, you know, I think he sold like half a million copies. And so like, of course he's got the personality and the reach for that, but he didn't go to like a big, um, like a big publisher, but it was also a topic that just wouldn't have probably sold um, to a bigger publisher. And the bigger publisher wouldn't really have known what to do with it, um, but he had the connections. And so it was really just a matter of getting it published and out there to his existing audience. 
It sounds like this, uh, and this is again from a, like a follow-up question, it sounds like their motivation is to, get, even though it is a very niche topic in our, and maybe in the, you know, the national American or even international community, but they want to get uh, that information about the Prophet Muhammad out there, right? So um, I don't think that, ch does that change the answer at all? In your mind, do you think still think uh, stick with self-publishing? I really think it depends on how it's written. Um, you know, I think there's this genre of books among children's books, for example, that it's all about like, you know, key historical figures and like, then start setting them up as heroes uh, or role models. So I think it just depends like how it's written. If it's written in a way that like, you kind of have to be a Muslim to appreciate it, then that's very different from like, if this is kind of setting him up as a model for all, all people, right? Okay. I, I know Simon & Schuster has a Muslim imprint uh, called Salam Reads um, that is I think only for children's books though. Uh, that's the only Im like Muslim imprint of one of the big five publishing houses that I'm aware of. Um, but hopefully that's a trend that's in increasing, inshallah. So. Yeah, I agree with that because there are a number of Christian imprints at these huge publishers. And you, you, know, you could write a Christian version of this book and, and get a kind of deal with them and, and sell thousands of books because there's a lot more Christians in this country than, and they buy books um, than there are Muslims. Um, but yeah. I mean, the, I, I do hope that trend continues as well. Sounds good. Okay. Uh, should you hire an editor before approaching an agent? No. So like, okay. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought I'm yeah, Go ahead, Asma. Um, I guess an editor for what, right? Um, but I think someone had told me that and then I started like talking to editors and they're just like, you know, first your writing is perfectly, like it's good. Like, I don't think that I can really help with it, right? And so I think it really depends one on your, how, how good of a writer you are. Um, but don't hire an editor. Um, I mean, an editor comes with your publisher. So yeah, that's just a lot of uh, money spent. Again, unless you feel like your writing needs a lot of help. I'm with Asma 100% on that. I've never hired an editor separate from, the editor comes free with the publishing house. So you don't need, an editor outside of that. That said, I would have certain people read it, um, like your so your friends who are readers. I would have some readers. You shouldn't be the only person reading it. Um, and you want people, if, if for instance, if, if you're trying to do something, the book is geared towards Muslims, you want to make sure you have Muslims reading it, right? Like for me, for the rooming prescription, I had my readers included um, a uh, Muslim convert, uh, included a Baha'i Iranian, because Baha'is, there's a lot of Baha'is in Iran, but they, and they, that's where that religion originates, and Rumi is very big for them, so I wanted to make sure for that community, like, to have, what, what did she think about it? So just think about who, who you want uh, represented in your readership and get people to read it. Don't let them charge you any money for that. These are your friends. They should be reading it for free. Sounds good. Uh, for a memoir, do we finish uh, writing the whole book before finding an agent? So I think, okay. again, it's the same question. Yeah, no, you don't have to. You don't have to. Cool. How is medium viewed for publishing? What do you think, Asma? I don't, I don't have an opinion on this. Neither do I. I've never published. <laughs> I've never published there. I don't know. Yeah. It strikes me as a place where people just put things that they don't know where else to put, but I, I have no idea. <laughs> okay, I think uh, Sumaya is asking in the chat, is it okay if we go over our time and end around 4.15 answer more questions, would that be all right? Sure. I have nowhere else to be, so I'm happy to stay after that. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're very, we, we're very lucky to have you with us. Um, amazing experiences from you both, seriously. Uh, amazing journeys to hear or learn about. Okay, the next question is, uh, thank you, yeah, seriously, thank you. What tips would you provide for publishing on mainstream news outlets? Move fast, make it extremely timely. I mean, 
timeliness is like everything. And then also making sure that you have a unique position on it, right? Don't say the thing that everybody else is saying. Um, I mean, if you're trying, I mean, it depends like which mainstream news, but if you're trying to get to like some, like the New York Times, the only thing I, only time I ever submit something to them is like, I'm the only one saying the thing that I'm saying, right? Um, and it's super timely. Um, so if you see something in the news that you, that you want to comment on, don't put it off for a day. Like you literally sometimes have to clear your schedule and just get that op-ed in and out. Um, so I would say those two things. Yeah, I, I agree with Asma on that. Um, the first piece I wrote for the New York Times, for instance, was about having bipolar disorder and being a lawyer and wanting to get rid of um, these discriminatory questions um, for certification of fitness. When you want to become a lawyer, they ask you about your mental health, or they used to. Um, and the ABA, National Conference of Bar Examiners, like wouldn't change this. They didn't realize it violated the Americans with Disabilities Act. So as somebody who's willing to be public about having bipolar and being a lawyer, like there aren't that many people who are willing to say both of those things. Um, and I was unaware of anybody else doing that. And they, um, that, that was about how I broke in. And since then I've published um, some other pieces with them that, but the first time you want to break into an outlet it need, it, like that, then it, it needs to be something exactly like Asma was saying, very timely, very, um, they call it a peg. You want to peg to something recent. And some, for some of you, like if you want to write opinion pieces and that feels really stressful to you to like, I, I write a lot about mental health. I'm unfortunately aware that there are shootings in this country. Um, I have several op-eds prepared for the next shooting to, God forbid it's somebody with a mental health issue and they start blaming mental health and, you know, and I'd have to update that. But point being, having something ready, for instance, you saw when um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg died, uh, we, uh, we had a, uh, immediately you got that op-ed up that was so long on the Times because they've been writing that op-ed forever, or the op-ed, that obituary forever. Um, they knew that that was coming uh, and we're preparing for it. So think of that, if you find it too stressful to be like, I need to be on top of it the second this happens, just know there are certain horrible events that will continue to happen <laughs> and try and prepare for that. Yeah, I noticed that as well. I think you're talking about the Linda Greenhouse piece. I was like, wow, this is really long. And you could tell mm -hmm. that the whole thing, we're just waiting for it. I haven't read it all yet, yeah. <laughs> That's actually amazing advice, you yeah. Be ready, be proactive. Well, they say that in all the op-ed workshops, I've done a bunch of them. Um, that's what, that's like one of the big pieces of advice is it's just like have it ready to go and then just be waiting for your news hook uh, and then just throw it up on what they call a lead paragraph. So like your first paragraph and then and, and send it out. Very cool. Okay, uh, are there any writing groups that you would recommend specifically groups that center the experiences mm -hmm. of women of color? I think there's a group called Vita. I haven't done any of those, um, but I think there's a group, there, there are, and I don't think it's women of color, I think it's writers of color just generally, um, but there, there have gotta be. I just, I've never been really great with writing groups in general. I teach in an MFA program uh, and I see what workshops do to people. And I'm very grateful that I never workshopped my first book because if I did, I never would have submitted it for publication anywhere uh, because it can be a really cruel process and the whole workshopping uh, still remains a highly patriarchal, just messed up on many levels, the, the workshop model. Uh, so if you're talking about writing groups in terms of workshops, I would just be aware of that part of it. Okay. Yeah, I to recommend. And my only experience with workshopping was I went to this program called Aspen Summer Words was put on by the Aspen Institute in Aspen, Colorado. And that was like my only, one and only taste of what that process is like. And I, I it just it seemed really jarring. Um, but I think that for my type of writing, um, workshopping is less, in, I feel like it's less useful or less important. And if any of you are interested in the attendees, if any of you are interested in doing MFA programs, I, I don't want to discourage you from doing that. If you are interested in it, I'm happy to talk to you um, about it. Yeah, that's something that came up in the, the last workshop, or excuse me, last webinar as well. So 
But I mean, for the record, I te I'm a visiting associate professor right now with no MFA and I'm teaching MFA students. So publishing mm -hmm. can help you get to a point where you'll be able to teach. Although I think it'll be hard for me if I wanted to find another teaching job somewhere else. I think I might have to get an MFA, which I don't look forward to. <laughs> okay. Uh, on the topic of research, FOIA can take years and be quite expensive. How much to rely on original documents versus personal memories? Um, so I never had to put out a FOIA request for anything that I was researching. I mean, the internet like basically has everything, <laughs> you know, um, or if it's not there, it's in a book somewhere. Um, so yeah, if you're trying to write a research-based book, I wouldn't say that you should rely solely on personal memories, uh, depending on what the thing is that you're writing about. Um, you should always, I love, I mean, I put a citation for everything. You want, that's one of the things you have to remember is just like when your book is out there, and that was the part that really kind of had me worried when I was writing my book, because again, ha having experience writing op-eds, we all know as you're kind of getting at Omer, like most of the time, the comment section is not very helpful. They're actually quite ruthless. Um, and so I was just like, oh my God, what's that gonna be like with a book, right? Cause then there's like book reviews and there's like professionals, you know, in different, you know, fields who are gonna be reading and judging you. Um, so you wanna make sure that you are as backed up as possible with like, you know, everything you say. Right. I think I skipped a couple of questions um, at Melody. Did we answer this one for memoirs? What is the ideal length for the entire book? How many pages and words was your memoir? Um, I think my, these are usually like 300 ish pages. Um, anywhere from 200 to 300 pages uh, is common, but there's always exceptions. Um, I, these days, like I, I think 90, 80 or 90,000 words is good. And that's something that in your proposal, you're going to say uh, how many words you expect it to be. And a proposal is a weird thing because ultimately the book that you write is going to be different than what you're telling them. And every publisher understands that. And as a writer, when you're writing something, often that's when you figure out what, you know, where the book is going. And I've never started writing a book that ended up being the same book that I started writing. <laughs> Um, it's not that it necessarily veered that far away, uh, but they, they've never been the exact same book I started. So that's part of the writing process so that your ideas evolve and that's good. You should let it, um, you shouldn't be so restricted by your outlines or whatever that you don't veer into the more creative side of things. Very cool. Uh, is there a website that you would recommend to publish for an autobiography? website that you would work I, you know, I, don't, I don't know about a website but just a, maybe a publisher in general that focuses on uh, that so there are publishers who do memoir like for instance my memoir about having bipolar disorder that memoir was uh avery which is an imprint of penguin random house that does a lot of health related um stuff and the roomy prescription is more spiritually oriented. And that was published by another imprint of Penguin Random House called Tartar Perigee. And they do a lot of wellness kind, kinds of books. So it, it depends, like when you look at the back of a book, you see that like where it will end up, will it be in, in memoir or spirituality or whatever region it's gonna be. So you wanna be looking at publishers who will do that. But I mean, if you're going to go the agent route, then you just want an agent who has familiarity with those publishers, because that's going to be the agent's job to know where to pitch it. And I really recommend when you're getting an agent, you look for somebody who has experienced publishing books that are in your uh, wheelhouse. Okay, I'm kind of skipping ahead, but we're on topic. So I just want to ask this one. There's a question that asks, uh, how do you determine which agent is a good fit for your work and will work hard for you? I know you both kind of touched on that in your stories, but maybe any other details to share? I mean, I think for me, my experience is that there's competitiveness. There's, there's like, I mean, there's a high level of competition at like every stage of this thing. And so for me, you know, finding a literary agent is very different from finding, for example, a real estate agent, right? Like a real, there's tons of them, they all want to serve you. 
Uh, but literary agents tend to be pretty, especially the ones that are successful, tend to be pretty hard to snag. Um, and so as a first time writer, honestly, like it was like, if you can get an agent um, that's, you know, one with a good track record, um, you know, that's a win in itself. Um, but yeah, but of course, if you have the type of experience that Melody had where the person's clearly wrong and leading you down the wrong path, then let them go. Uh, but I think in the absence of that, you have to understand it's, it's pretty competitive. Yeah, and I, um, this pile of submissions that agents get is just crazy. So I would try and find some sort of in my, the way that I got my second agent, her name's Aisha Pande, and she's wonderful. I, I really can't say enough great things about her, uh, was because, like I said, there was that editor that was interested in uh, Random House who who couldn't sell it to the higher ups after her. So she, when I I was so frustrated with publishing that when I wanted to, um, when I wanted to sell Haldol and Hyacins, I just said, you know, I'm a lawyer and I'm so sick of this industry. I'm going to sell it myself. And she was like, I'm not letting you do this. And thank God she didn't because I was going to sell myself so short. Um, I would have sold that book for so much less uh, if I, if I didn't have her guiding me. And so far I have. Alhamdulillah, I have had these fairy godmothers, they're all women, uh, who have just helped me without needing to. Um, like there was no reason for them to ever help me and they helped me to no end to get my books out um, and to, to find an agent. And I ended up having five agents who were interested in interviewing them all. And so I have, and ultimately Aisha, her, she responded to every point. She wrote down her responses and we spoke on the phone. A bunch of the other agents were like, oh my God, I can't believe you have this many questions. Let's talk on the phone. Uh, but I, I liked that Aisha responded to everything and uh, was timely about it. And I made it a point to talk to some of her other clients uh, before I signed with her. Uh, and I made it a point to sign with her. Some people don't actually sign with agents. Some agents just had, they still do this in publishing that some people have handshake deals. And if that's what you want to do, that's great. Um, but that, that's not the way that I generally function. So um, there, but there, there's always like the, my rule with this is like, go to any bookstore and look at the books that are out. And there's so many horrible books that have been written no matter how bad your writing is, there is something worse that has been published and was a New York Times bestseller. Um, and I'm not, like there's horrible writing out there. So I genuinely like the, the way that you succeed in this profession is you just do not give up. Uh, you really like that is persistence is key. Well said, wow. Maybe I'll write a book now. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I mean, just <laughs> Second, that point about persistence. Um, I mean, I try sort of getting that through now, my presentation as well, because I think that's everything. There's so many stages of this, you're just going to want to give up, uh, but just don't. Awesome. Okay, I think we have maybe like five questions left, but only one minute left. So, apologies to whoever's questions we couldn't answer. Let me see if I can pick the one that's like the most new. Um, what about, okay, I think this is a little bit different. So what about starting out as a, actually, no, I'm sorry, I can't, I think you did answer that. Let's just go in order. Uh, when you wrote op-eds, would you pitch them? And so is there a pitching process when you would write op-eds? Yes. Um, and how, how did that look like? I mean, so most of the time I don't like sending my, my op-eds to uh, just sort of like generic email addresses. Um, I try to find a personal contact through, you know, my network. Um, and so, you know, if you're new to it, I would say pit, like write the whole thing out uh, and pitch it to you, you sort of write a short summary of it and then you can sort of post your full op-ed below. Um, but once you kind of have that relationship and you've published once at least at, a, at an outlet, usually the editor will tell you, you know, next time, feel free to pitch me ideas. You don't need to write the whole thing out which is great because it saves a lot of time. Um, but yeah, I would say draft the whole thing out, make sure it's within the word limit that you see typically is published by that outlet um, and then put like a summary above and then just attach the whole thing. Yeah, and I would definitely paste it in the body of an email because if this is their first time getting 
a submission from you, then they're not going to open an attachment uh, from somebody they don't know. So the other thing, in addition to pasting it and also attaching it as a Word document, I would make it a point to uh, keep your email to them very, 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 very short. Short, but also have a compelling sort of summary of right. it. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. There's sometimes people send me stuff to look over before they pitch and it's like, it's really long email. They're like, no, no editor's gonna read that. Um, and the same, I mean, if you're reaching out to other authors or anybody you want help from, ask them a specific question. I'm so sick of the day of like, let me pick your brain. Like, tell me what you want and I'll help you. But I don't let people pick my brain unless they pay me for that. <laughs> so uh, when you, if you want people to help you, be very specific about what you're asking. Uh, and you'd be surprised how many people just don't know how to ask for what they want. Really well said. So I'm just going to pass things over to Sumaya to close things out. But thank you so much for the amazing responses and really feeling blessed to have been able to learn from you both. Uh, both have an amazing, amazing journey. And I'm sure you still have uh, quite a bit to accomplish. So it's if you're both just getting started. But thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was amazing. This was wonderful. And um, we're really fortunate to have Muslim writers like yourself in our community who can now mentor and share their experience with younger writers so, or uh, individuals with less experience. So thank you so much for um, sharing all that information and for your time. Um, I also wanted to thank all the attendees who, um, who made it to this webinar and we will send out an email tomorrow with the recording of this webinar and the WhatsApp links, our um, social media platforms, and we also will add you to our email list. So just email us back if you don't want to be added to our email list. And uh, again, there are two upcoming webinars um, on children's writing and academic uh, publishing which is scheduled for next week and um, the, the, the fourth one will follow. So we will send an email and include that information um, as well. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Omar. Um, thank you, Salma, for managing the logistics uh, at the back end of this webinar. And thank you again. So have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everyone.